come and see my epic failure on a job that involved a group of intoxicated youngsters in the woods, a 4x4 and a scalpel. Learn from my mistakes so you can avoid similar problems in your clinical practice. My name is Alex Hepner and this is Group Call. My dispatch mentioned a group of people in their 20s who had gone camping in the woods with one of them sustaining unspecified injuries. At scene, it became evident that the individuals were highly intoxicated and had used the 4x4 to engage in a hardcore version of hide and seek. As a result, one male patient had been run over and trapped under the jeep, suffering from massive head trauma and Maxfax injuries with completely obstructed airways. As you can imagine, I had no choice but to go for a surgical airway. The surgical airway, also known as emergency front of neck access or cricothyroidotomy, involves inserting a tube into the patient's trachea through an incision in the cricothyroid membrane. A recent meta-analysis revealed an overall surgical airway success rate of 88%. It's no surprise considering that the first fully documented procedure was performed 100 years before Christ by Asclepiades of Bithynia, giving mankind over 2,000 years to practice this technique. Jokes aside, remember this is an extremely invasive measure used only when you cannot oxygenate your patient in any other way. Typically, it's used in cases of serious maxfax trauma with major hemorrhage to the airway, unmanageable choking or severe airway edema in anaphylaxis. In other words, a really bad day in the office and yes, on that day it was my office. I prepared a scalpel, a bougie, an intubation tube size 6 and a 10 mil syringe. Two smart moves I made. I had the tube prepared on the bougie and I kept everything clean and in open packages. I knew that when I start the procedure I won't have free hands to open packages. Anyway, I tried to palpate a landmark, the cricothyroid membrane, but I couldn't find it. Therefore, I used the four-finger technique, in which the clinician places the small finger in the sternal notch with the tip of the index finger estimating the location of the membrane. Again, I was unsuccessful. I knew that, as described in this publication, both methods can have a high failure rate in elderly, obese females or adolescents, but my patient was in his 20s, so theoretically I should have had any problems finding the membrane. What I didn't know back then underneath the car was that the trachea angulates posteriorly in males and a laryngeal prominence of the thyroid cartilage may have different shapes in different patients, resulting in difficulty in finding the site of incision. Just look how different anatomy can be. For that reason, this study suggests performing a long vertical incision to visualize required structure first and then performing a horizontal cut to the cricothyroid membrane. There were two problems though. One, due to the limited access to my patient, performing a long cut in a safe manner was almost impossible. Two, this type of cut usually creates a splash of blood and I didn't have a proper face shield. I know, I know, bad paramedic. Human factors started kicking in. I became more stressed than normal because the procedure I was familiar with suddenly became difficult. And that's why I decided to use the laryngeal handshake. This method is described as more time consuming than other techniques with a success rate of only 62%. But it's recommended by the Difficult Airway Society, the Faculty of Intensive Care Medicine, and last but not least, Royal College of Anesthetists. Uh, therefore, I decided that it's sensible to utilize it. I used my non-dominant hand to grasp the lower part of the thyroid cartilage firmly between my thumb and middle fingers and gently rolled in from side to side. Then, I slid my fingers inferiorly and pushed the skin between them down so that the next skin become taut and easier to cut. Subsequently, I used my index finger to fill the landmarks and pinpoint the area for making my incision. Bingo! Due to the limited space, I decided to use the scalpel bougie technique. Now, please observe carefully. I made a horizontal incision on the cricothyroid membrane and then I pointed the scalpel downwards with the cutting edge facing the patient's feet. That's how I created a kind of a triangle and that's where the bougie should go. Then I passed the bougie along the surface of the scalpel's blade. Once I was in, I removed the scalpel and fed the bougie through approximately 5 centimeters. 
The last step was feeding the tube down and that's when I faced another unpleasant surprise. The tube didn't really fit in the hole. Gentle rotation helped, but I was really sweaty and it wasn't a pleasant feeling. What I've learned now and what we all should be aware of is that while the Difficult Airway Society recommends tubes of size 5 or 6, due to the different heights of the cricothyroid membrane, the size of the tube should be rather 3 or 4 centimeters. For more details, please read this study. That was the moment when my backup arrived, so all I had to do was to fix the tube and fill the balloon up. And that's something uh, we all should be aware of. The maximal diameter of the human trachea is 2 cm, exactly the diameter of your 20 mm syringe. If you will overinflate the balloon of the tube, you will create a significant pressure on the inner trachea walls, which will not only cause iatrogenic trauma, but also significantly increase the intrathoracic pressure. Therefore, remember, if you cannot use a proper manometer, at least inflate the tube with a number of millimeters that matches its diameter. So five milliliters of air for size five, six milliliters of air for uh, six, uh, for tube six, etc. For more interesting tips on airway management, please watch this video. My name is Alex Hepner and this was Group Call.